wonderful performers, uh, composers. It was really great. Um, and I want to start with the last piece we heard was yours, Gusty. Um, I thought it was interesting, a scat. So you're having instruments play, um, imitate singers imitating instruments, right? <laughs> Uh, and, and so I have sort of two part question for you. I want to ask you both about the idea of the stat in general, what you were thinking and how you manifest it, but also um, sort of interesting to me, your relationship to jazz, because you said in your notes that you, I mean, that's an ongoing thing. It's funny, because there's not a lot of, at least the pieces I've heard, both not overt jazz, but the fact is when you said that, I instantly recognized like, in so much of the sort of rhythmic structure of pieces. So I wonder if you could talk about like your relationship to jazz and tell us a little bit about the stat. Yeah, let's share this one. I think so. Yes. Oh, I cool. think it'd be a little louder. Anyway, well, thank you, Sebastian. And I would just start by saying how happy I am to be here at the Institute. It's a huge honor for me. And thank you all for having me. And I feel a little shy talking about my own work because my piece is so tiny in well, a way. Good. But um, since you've asked, one of the things that's always been of great interest to me is this balance between a kind of highly nuanced score and a feeling of spontaneity. And I've been working on that for about 25 years, how to balance that so that the pieces can sound like they're uh, in a way jumping off the stage or can be played with flair, with an inner life, with a sense of trajectory, and yet have musicians know exactly what was intended by the notation. So that's something that's always been interested in me. And with jazz, I like the sense of, uh, of so many things, but uh, reaching for the next note finding the next note. It doesn't always have to be the in note, it could be an out note, but going for something and a sense of spontaneity in the sound, as opposed to something that's very sort of predictable and boxed in. Um, I'm interested in reaching for something that has some uh, motion inside of it. Now this piece scat is really tiny compared to like sort of what I've made, so it feels, it's hard to ex exemplify that in a, in a short piece, but those are some of the things I'm start hearing like timbres are you approximating or is it more just sort of the idea of the lines and stuff well i was thinking that you know yeah, yeah. this kind of thing right well we heard that in those yeah. sections that was great um, yeah. uh, but just like that <laughs> you know but but then to blend it so you would have like a pizzicato and then a bartok pizzicato and then a, a soft clarinet and then the piano and you know it never is the same twice in the right, whole right, you know right. just zipping all around in different ways um, kind of kaleidoscopic way of approaching it. Um. Great. Yeah, yeah, they're really great. Um, and and um, maybe I'll move to Laura, since yours actually, I mean, it's a totally different sounding piece, but um, the same instrumentation and actually, um, however, this existence, several different instrumentations, has a version with viola instead of clarinet. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and also about the called her, um, it's funny, um, Michelle, my girlfriend said, oh, you know, she's an artist, and she said after listening to it, she said, oh, it really made me think of Calder. Um, so I, I thought that was, um, that, you know, that's a definitely a good thing. So could you tell us a little bit, like, how that was? And also, are the titles actually from individual Calder works? I don't actually know those pieces, so give us some context. Well, all of the movements are um, in reference to a specific piece of Calder's called Sir Calder. And in fact, it's at the Whitney, and I saw it yesterday when oh I went really? to the new Whitney. Uh -huh. So it was very funny to be there and see it. It's a much larger space if you've seen the new museum. And so there's much more of it on view. There are about 400 pieces oh really? in the Sir Calder. And he used to go around and do this. It was a performance piece because they're little wire circus figures. And so he'd m have to make them move. And you know, he'd shoot this little guy out of the cannon or he'd you know, balance the little lady on the, on the wire. And, and so each one of these movements actually references one of those figures and sort of the overall zaniness, because if you've seen the video of Calder doing this, it's quite zany. Um, nothing's quite syn synchronized. And, and in fact, the first movement, things aren't supposed to be quite synchronized, right? And it's not until the very last movement where they get to be all together at the very last statement. Um, but the, there is one movement that is not referenced in uh, the referencing the Calder, and that's the fourth movement, which is the, um, the bird. bird that's trapped in the circus tent. And that's actually from a, an experience of my own from youth. When I was a little girl, I was taken to the Barnum and Bailey <laughs> Circus as a kid in Milwaukee, actually, when my parents lived in Wisconsin. And there was a bird trapped in the tent, and it just it, it, it broke my heart. 
So the whole time I kept saying to my parents, is that, is that bird going to make it? Is it going to be okay? Mm -hmm. And so that's that image of the bird you're being trapped. You're a number of years later, you're still... And trying to get <laughs> out, yeah. And so the circus for me is inexorably um, linked to that experience uh -huh. of, of the bird. I, I assume it was also intentional. I, th I thought it was interesting. You have a lot of, you know, trapeze, high wire, and you have a lot of high register stuff, which sort of evokes that. You're feeling that little bit of sort of precariousness of being high. Yeah, very, um, and the whole piece is really on the high end of right. the spectrum. You don't really hear those low um, fundamental pitches. You hear those overtones, and um, and it is supposed to evince that that sense that you're everything's very nebulous. You're not sure whether you're going to survive. The funny thing about that is that uh, a high wire act. Um, artist came up to me after one of the performances of this piece and said, you know, I know what you're trying to get at there. You're trying to make it seem like it's very hard and that we may fall any moment, but you know, it's really easy for us. <laughs> 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 we feel really comfortable on that wire. <laughs> this made me think, That's oh. pretty funny. Um, do you guys feel do you <laughs> comfortable <laughs> on that wire? Or <laughs> um, maybe a good time to ask you about, about that. Um, and I, I'll return to um, the other pieces in a minute. Um, but in terms of preparing this program and having these pieces, very different aesthetics, as you hear, seven pieces all coming sort of from um, different sides. And um, mostly I had contact with Anna in terms of working out the details of the program. Um, but um, did you guys go back and forth amongst yourselves in terms of repertoire and making the final choices? Do you want to talk about that a bit? Um, well, in this case, I think it was mostly, uh, you know, my, my exchange with you, Sebastian, because this was a very special kind of program. And um, I just think it was an amazing thing to have all these women, you know, composing for you. All Indeed. these pieces that were not composed for us, but um, uh, somehow coming together and the, the different styles and the different energies, it was really um, wonderful. It was really, but Peggy it was, and I were saying, you know, it seemed like such a long program to us when we were just, just now, because I think because the different styles and were so varied. So I don't know if that, that came across. I mean, really, it, it was a, a gamut of but it didn't feel like a long program, right. by the way. <laughs> but, 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 it, but it did. But it of course, it's yeah. very, it's very, very, yeah. which is exactly what I was hoping to have happen. And um, and while we're talking about sort of being very big, the next thing to bring up is is the instrument, which I'm sure you are all fascinated in, um, with, was the marimba. And um, Andrea, you could tell us. I mean, the thing about it is too, you have to understand, it's a very hard technique that players don't normally use. You notice that she had the four. Um, the two mallets in each hands were doing different rhythms. Could you talk about the whole technique and how the piece, this is a collaboration with a, um, a marimbas from Portugal or where uh, are the... Uh, uh, kind of from Spain, yeah, from actually. Spain. Well, first, I, I, I have to say something. So this is great to be here, not only because it's nice to be back at the Institute, but because on this stage, there's two women here that were my mentors. And that was Melinda Wagner. She was my mentor in 2008 in orchestral reading program. And Augusta was my mentor at Tango in 2009. So it's great to see, to there be on the go. same stage with people that helped me grow as a composer. So it's very nice to be here with them. Uh, regarding the piece. So the piece was commissioned by Miguel Bernat. He's a virtuoso from Spain. He's an incredible, incredible percussionist. So it's done. Um, he commissioned that, that piece with a very particular technique in mind, and that was kind of a challenge for me because I felt I was a little bit talking about cages. I felt that I was in a cage that I could not get out. He, he was so specific about what he wanted. So the te technique consists of, so he's holding, uh, the percussionist is holding four mallets, and uh, each mallet has to be independent. So you have independence of rhythms, but especially of dynamics also. And um, the challenge is to be aware of the time that these changes need to take place in order to have a kind of a smooth arch within a piece. So it's a lot of different things to control at the same time. And it kind of, John, I was worried that you're going to be on the verge of a nerv nervous breakdown with this because a lot of things to think about. And also the difference is Miguel Bernard has a different gripping technique than John. So, which also made things a little bit more difficult for John. So, my applause to John, he did a great job. Um, Sounded great. To add to, to add to the stress, right? One more thing. So, that's the concept, and, and uh, I was inspired by this poem by Helmut Amid, which is a poet from the Middle Ages, uh, from Beja, which is now today Portugal, from the Andalus, so Spain, Portugal. Um, 
And as you read in program notes, there's two elements that water and then the shadow element that is kind of a little bit of um, uh, fragments of the water that shows musically fragments of what was heard during the water section. So I play a little bit with these two textures. Uh -huh. Great, well, it yeah, sounds great, it's a great sound. Um, and, and you really do hear the control of sort of the dynamic arcs of, of different lines and stuff. Um, um, and Mindy, oh, um, beautiful piece, and um, I, I want to ask you about the title. I, it's funny, I, I knew thought. It. I yeah, knew it. No, 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 because, because <laughs> I'll tell you why. I was thinking, it says faux variations, but I mean, God, you're the only one who calls them faux variations. <laughs> because there's so many variations that, you know, sort of like, they might start, but then if you actually look, they sort of taper off and go various places. So, what were you thinking? I mean, tell us a little bit about the idea of that. And of course, that's sort of the middle section, right? The outer section is more this romanza. Yeah. yeah. In the middle section, there are, are episodes that kind of one leading to the next in a, in a chain way, right. but um, I will say beforehand that um, uh, finding titles is something that I do after the piece is finished. And some composers work exactly the opposite way. They come up with very beautiful, evocative titles um, and perhaps work um, with that as a, as, as, a, as a starting point. And I, I find titles to be actually annoying to come up with, but this one, I, I kept um, thinking each episodic section sounded like it really should be varied and that I should keep something very fundamental from one section to the next and play on that and keep that, um, that fundamental thing, that prime mover into the third and into the fourth section. And it really didn't happen that way. So as Peggy pointed out, it was really varied development, which is the way I work m most of the time anyway. And you know, what, what is brought to mind for me is um, the acts that your philosophy professor brings up um, on the first day of class. You know, if you have this beautiful axe, but the, but the handle is worn out and you replace the handle um, and then sometime down the road you replace the head of the axe. Is it the same axe, okay? So with my music, um, that's more my process. As it's it's a, uh, gradually replacing the handle and then eventually replacing the, uh, you know, the head. And then what you have at the end is something that is uh, entirely new in, in terms of its molecules, but it's also the same in terms of ownership. And um, so different from a variation, right? Which would have kept maybe that one little molecule from the, from the axe. All the way through. So continue a through. chain of relationships, yes. but not an overarching relationship or something. But like I will that. say, you know, I think the piece has a very long line in it, which, um, makes it very hard for some inexperienced players to to play because it's many, many measures. And uh, these players did a spectacular job at bringing that together. Um, it's, you know, 20, 30 measures that they have to keep a steady uh, rise and work the descent out. So um, that mm -hmm. part worked very well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, sounded great. Um, and, and now it's sort of, in a second, take questions, but change the subject a little bit, um, and to the fact that indeed um, we have a concert of all women. And um, so I, I step back about so a little bit about myself. To my mom's a composer, and she's Very eighty. Good one. Oh, thank you. And and she's eighty four now. And so I grew up like knowing like the difficulties of being a woman. I mean, at the time she was writing, I mean, you know, you had these male teachers who told you, you know, women they can't figure out form, and and she had so few. I mean, think of it. That time there were so few role models, right, in um, her age group. Um, so I've sort of seen this sea change. And, and, and the thing I want to bring up is like in the last, um, particularly the last 15, 20 years, it seems, I mean, there are so many women working in repertoire of huge um, careers. Um, Caius Arejo has performed all over the world. I mean, all of these art women are too, but she's having operas at the Met and so on, um, by any standard, she would be one of Europe's biggest composers. Um, and so I want to sort of talk, but it, but it seems also one, one, one can be celebratory on the one hand. On the other hand, you can't be complacent because things are better, um, but they're not, um, you know, they're not totally there yet. It's sort of like America with r race relationships too. You can, there are some things to celebrate, but you can't, you know, you have to look at it squarely too. So I wonder just sort of how, two questions for all of you, how it feels to be like just over the course of um, the last two decades of writing, or maybe a little less for you, um, yes. Um, and um, so how that feels, and also what do you think of 
you know, for the place in time we are, what is it that you would ideally want or you think should happen or one should concentrate on? I mean, any impression, and then we'll open it up to everybody else. Well, I, I might have a, a, a slightly different uh, point of view because I come from sure. a different country Absolutely. where things are very, very different. So when I got here to the United States, this was unbelievable. I thought, wow, so many possibilities, so many opportunities, so many things that I can do that I could not ever even dream in my, I've, I'm from P Portugal, and I was born in 71. Um, we had democracy in 74, so there was no music school available when I was growing up. Um, not for girls, not for boys. Um, it was very, very hard, and I only started uh, studying music at 17. I had to come to the United States in order to have a very good musical education. I went to New England Conservatory, and I only started composing much later in my 30s. So, that said, uh, the, the unbelievable array of opportunities that I got here, it was just unthinkable. And the things that I lived in my country while I was, I was a performer before I was a composer. I mean, I think that if most of those things that happened to me in my country would have happened to me in the United States, that there was a lot of lawsuits flying around because those things were unbelievable, trauma traumatizing, and that's probably part of one of the reasons why I decided to study United States. I think things are different now, uh, probably, but I still go back to my country. I don't see any women composer making it. And teaching in universities, maybe one or two women composers that are actually not having any music played. So things are still different. So for me, this is incredible. And I'm really, really happy to be here. That's yeah. it. <laughs> Great. Well, I wish I could mirror that. <laughs> um, it's well, everybody's experience is different. I yeah, expect that. Yeah, I, I think that, that um, the United States has come very far in, in our years. I mean, I think we're close to the same generation, the three of us. And I would say that, you know, of the students that come to study with me, um, at least half of them are women, um, which is an incredible thing. Yeah, it's an incredible it's an amazing proportion, yeah. But um, then what happens to them after is a different story. Because if you look at, in, and in fact, I was just in touch with Mindy about this because we were organizing a conference about sort of women composers and the state of women in composition in the States. If you look at the numbers, and I had to look at the numbers to organize this conference, um, the numbers of women who go on and then get prof professorships and then continue are much smaller. And then if you look at those that are tenured, it's even you, a much smaller percentage. So uh, there are women in departments, but they're not being tenured at the same level. And I have to say that, you know, you heard it tonight, the range and the depth and the beauty of this music. If, if, if last year this happened with my contemporary ensemble, I programmed a concert of, of music and I didn't choose to do all women. And I looked back and someone said to me, you know, do you realize you programmed all women? And I was stunned because I hadn't planned to do that. Right, that's the way it should be actually. I that's just right, picked, right. you know, seven pieces I loved. And um, in fact, I think I programmed pieces bo both by Mindy and by Augusta. We did scat at um, UW a couple of years ago. And that, you know, so I guess what I'm trying to say is the level is there. It really is there. And now it's time for, for marketers and programmers and ensembles to sort of catch up to that. But and, and thank goodness for Sebastian and his efforts here, you know, bringing these wonderful composers and, and pieces. But anyway, that's my experience. Great. Yeah, I'm not sure I can add anything, um, but I, I think f for me, I'm really interested in excellence and whether it's by uh, someone who's male or female or um, of any other persuasion or any background or any ethnicity or any religion, it's just some, some piece that's so good, it just really, really interests me. And I, I do a lot of programming and running festivals and serving on boards and things, and I try very hard to um, support women and men and all, all kinds of things. Um, but I think we, ha we have to stick with excellence and that has to be the bottom line. And I think, I'm not saying anyone didn't say that, I'm just amplifying that 
I think that's one of the points, though. I think I, I, that Laura said, haven't we maybe reached that point? So now it is. I mean, do you, don't you think? I mean, that there's enough out there. It's not as if you can make the argument. Oh well, we couldn't find a piece by a woman to program. I mean, that's that's not going to fly, right? E yeah. Exactly. And <coughs> I'll just say one small story. About a decade ago or, or so, I was commissioned by the Berlin Philharmonic, and I wrote a, a piano concerto. And at that time, it, the way it was, it was the first woman that they had commissioned. So it was a media blitz, and there was like every German newspaper came and interviewed me, and they said, what's it like to be a woman <laughs> composer? And then like the next interview, tell me, what is it like to be a woman <laughs> composer? And then like the, the third interview, there's like a whole week of this. Right. And I like, kept, I don't read German, so I don't know if they translated me right. <laughs> um, but anyway, so then it was the final night, it was like this huge black tie thing, and like all these formal German people there, and <laughs> it was like 500 people in the pre-concert lecture. And then this really elegant, very articulate, uh, the head of the orchestra was interviewing me. And we sit down and he says, now, Miss Thomas, what is it like to be a woman <laughs> composer? And I was so sort of, uh, I was extremely polite, yeah. I promise you. I was yeah. like super polite. But I said, you know, when you have Pierre Boulez or a Luciano Berrio <laughs> or Helmut Lachman here and you ask them, What's it like to be a male composer? <laughs> then I'll answer. Right. And the whole the whole crowd was just cheering. And he didn't mean it rudely, and I didn't mean it rudely right. at all. But it, it's just now we're past that. I think right. it was a point that had to be made exactly. Yeah, and I later thought of better answers, but <laughs> but in any case, um, well, that was a good one. I think that's, that's excellent. <laughs> but you know, so we're, we're past that, and I think that's important. Yeah. But we we have to just look for really good things. Mindy. I want to echo what Gusty said about excellence. Um, and tonight, um, I'd, I'd like to invite you to ask yourselves, were you really aware that you were listening to the music of women? I found myself not being aware at all, or not even thinking oh. about it or caring. Um, I was only listening for the, you know, the, 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 what the music was going to do and say to me um, in that particular voice. So, and sure. that, that, is, that is precisely what it should be like. But it has been a very difficult road, and I have been asked that, questions, that question more times than I'd, <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time I've been asked that question, what's it like? And so I, I feel like my answer to that uh, has been and, and will continue to be is, well, what's it like when I, I think about the fact that I have brown eyes? <laughs> um, right, right. You know, uh, do I get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, oh, wow, I have brown eyes. This is going to change my day. Right. Um, but on the other hand, my being a woman has absolutely everything to do with my composing, only because everything in our lives informs our art. Um, but the important point is, it's only this woman, okay? Right. And, and, uh, and that is what it should be. Oh, absolutely. It's I'm only this man, it's only this woman, it's only, you know, the, the person who's, right. whose experiences are affected. And if you have kids and you have all these complications in your life, yes, it's going to affect your work. Right. Um, I, I, oh, okay, and I was... I, I just wanted to say, okay. and, you know, Mindy's won the Pulitzer Prize, not that prizes matter and, but, and or anything like that, but that's pretty cool. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, by the way, in terms of your comment about, um, I mean, listening for women, yeah, I don't think there's nothing. I mean, uh, years ago, this is even, I don't know if they've done, the, anybody's done this with a woman, but I'm sure it's exactly the same. Donald Hennehan did with pianists. He brought, he, because there was, a, in those days, more talk about, oh, female pianists can tell. And he took a bunch of people and recordings of female, male. Nobody had any idea, literally. There was like zero, you know, ability to, to read it. I mean, sure, that's... Um, that's all, it's just, as you say, irrelevant sort of stuff, and it's about the person. Um, and so, in a way, that's I wanted this concert to be, I mean, it's just varied music to listen to. It just happens to be um, bio women, exactly exactly to make that point, in a way, yeah. Great, but let me let me open it up. Oh, do you want to say well, one thing, and then well I'll open I just wanted to say something um, just that echoes what Mindy was saying, and that's that, you know, um, there is this, this thought that women write a certain kind of music. And I think the difference between my generation and... Andrea's generation is that expectation is sort of falling away, which is a good thing. Um, but, but there is this expectation that because you're a woman, you're going to write this sort of 
beautiful, sweet, lovely pastoral music, you know. And I remember once at the at, at the Kennedy Center, um, a pre uh, post -co um, concert talk just like this, a guy got up and asked this question: "What's a nice girl like you writing music like that for?" <laughs> What did you say? <laughs> and I walked up to him afterwards and I said, because that's what I hear. <laughs> and, and, and the fact is, is that, you know, I loved Mindy's comment about would you know? Because I think that all of the pieces sort of, you know, they beguile you in different ways, but they're not necessarily, you know, feminine in this of sort of, you know, this way that's, that's, that's derogatory or thought of as being derogatory. Um, I think all the pieces actually have this life that, that is, you know, on both sides, masculine, feminine, who knows what else. And, and that's what makes the, this music so exciting, I think. Absolutely. Um, but let me, uh, a few questions from the audience. Anybody have a question for anybody here? Um, yes? Perfect. I mean, exa exactly. I'm, I'm glad. That's that's great. Um, anybody else? Oh, you must have questions <laughs> because I know you do. Oh. <laughs> I Well, in, in many cases, there were special effects that were asked for by the composers. Um, for example, at the beginning of Laura's oh, piece. that was. You kept the Yes. Okay. At the beginning of Laura's piece, I don't play for I don't know how many seconds, but I put down the sustaining pedal so that the flute sound reverberates in the piano. Okay. Yeah, so that, that was intentional. That was asked for by the composer. Um, yeah. It works. Yeah. It's, it's a great effect. Um, and also in... Bunching Lamb's piece, Another Spring, um, she makes use of the middle pedal, the sostenuto pedal, um, which is somewhat unusual still in piano repertoire, but uh, if you um, press some notes silently, usually in the bass, and then catch them in the middle pedal, then other notes resonate. This is a sympathetic vibration. And so you, you heard it in there. So that's, that's a technique as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, she she says in the score, sostenuto pedal or right pedal or left pedal, so uh, we know which one. Um, that's a that's a really good question. Usually, if it's meant to be a special effect, it's notated. Um, but sometimes the middle pedal, for those of you who play piano, you know, sometimes you can't. You can't reach something or you can't hold it because you need both hands up here. So that tends to be the player's choice. He certainly didn't. He didn't yeah. have, he had an organ pedal. He didn't pedals, even have a so right uh, pedal, actually. Yeah, yeah, he didn't have any pedals. <laughs> right. No, I mean, the pedal, the pe that's so interesting that you say that because, uh, you know, I, well, we could get going on this, but, <laughs> you know, I sort of think for pianists, you know, we have, we have a different trajectory. When, when you start playing piano, you know, you're often five or six or something like that. You know, piano is kind of easy at the beginning. In a sa it always sounds good. You know, I, I applaud violinists, for example, because, you know, it's so hard, or oboists, you know, it's so hard at the beginning. But the piano gets really, really hard later on. <laughs> but one of the things that the sort of dividing line, when, when we start to use the pedal artistically, is where you make a real leap into what kind of player you are. And in fact, um, Oh, I have an old um, music magazine that's kind of, uh, I think it's about 100 years old, and there's an article in it by Olga Samarov, who, who taught at Juilliard, and uh, it's all about the pedal. And she says, the pedal is the soul of the pianist. <laughs> so it's really, that's in a way, you know, that's our, that's our expression. Um, it's like our vibrato. So the right, the right pedal, the use of that becomes really our, our coloring effect. Yeah. Great. Uh, Daniel oh. Barenboim, um, who was writing about performing courses, and he's fantastic. Oh, sorry. He, 
<laughs> of course, he's a world-renowned pianist, and he, he, he actually said that the, the piano without the pedal is really a rather boring instrument because it's, it's, it's a, a very quick attack, and, it, and you can't control what the attack is doing unless you actually wave in front of the strings or something like that. But, you know, the piano is pretty, um, is, is a very definite sound, and the attack just fades away very quickly. Whereas you can control your attack and your decay on any other instrument. So it's what you do with the pedal and the way you phrase and the way you hang on to the keys that makes all the difference. But, you know, just hitting the note alone is a pitch. Yeah. And it's gone. The pedal, the pedal actually also operates to blend the different registers of the piano. Because if you play the notes in isolation, again, the, the timbre is so different, but the pedal is the equalizer throughout the registers. Great. Well, on that note of that <laughs> edification of um, <laughs> detailed um, pedaling, um, thank you all so much. Fantastic concert, all of you. Thank you. Thanks for coming.